Hey everyone, this is The Rewriter, writing in. Today's video will be part 2 of my ultimate Batman Arkham Knight rewrite. Be sure to check out part 1 to see the beginning. But before we begin, I want to say a couple things. First, thank you all so much for the crazy support lately. We've grown now to over 600 subscribers, and it's all because of you. Thank you for liking, commenting, and subscribing. It means so much to me that you all enjoy my content. Also, I pinned this comment to part 1, but I want to make the announcement here as well that I've started a Discord server called Rewriters Roundtable, where you can interact with me and fellow viewers as we discuss all about our favorite movies, TV shows, and video games. This server will also allow you the opportunity to share your stories, which I would love to read. The link for that is in the description below, I'd love to see you there. So with this intro out of the way, let's dive into part 2 of the ultimate Batman Arkham Knight rewrite. Dick is scrubbing through the video footage of Bruce's speech the other day, looking for signs of who could be behind this giant ruse. Oracle is attempting to reconnect her feed with Tim, constantly getting the signal up before it just completely drops. Tim suddenly comes from the top of the stairs, limping down them. Oracle calls out for Tim, and Dick turns around and runs up the stairs, helping Tim down them and sits him on a medical table. Tim takes his mask off, showing that his eye is black and there's blood coming down his nose. Alfred grabs a tray of bandages and some ice, having Tim put it against his head. Oracle asks him what happened, and why did the signal cut out? Tim looks around as everyone is gathered around him, telling them that he's somehow back. Alfred asks Master Tim who he's referring to. Tim tells them that Jason Todd is alive, and he's been behind Bruce's disappearance. Alfred drops the tray on the ground, needing to sit down. Dick and Oracle ask how this is possible and if he's really sure that Jason was there and not some trick. Tim replies that he's not sure how he survived, but it was really him. He had all the scars to prove it. Dick asks what Jason wanted, and where did he go? Tim answers that he tried to warn him about being Robin, tried to get him to join him in what he called saving Gotham. He said that Bruce would discard him once he's outlived his usefulness to him. Is that true? Oracle puts her hand on Tim, telling him that Jason is unwell. He always has been, and that he was trying to get in his head. Bruce values Tim far more than he ever will know. He values everyone in this family, even if he isn't always blatant about it. Tim answers Dick's other question, saying that he has some plan involving lethal force to keep Gotham safe, whatever that meant. It seems that they've figured out now who is leading all the villains. Dick replies back that that doesn't make sense. Why would Jason side with villains for his mission to protect Gotham? That seems counterproductive. Alfred adds that perhaps he isn't working with them, rather forcing them to work for him. They all saw the last bit of footage before Master Tim's connection got cut, a pile of dead bodies by his handiwork. Master Jason was always so troubled, it pains him greatly that Jason has returned in such a broken state. He can't imagine the effects that it must be having on Bruce. Just then, Lucius tells them to look at the screen, showing the news. Vicky Vale is standing outside of a club, telling the audience that the illustrious Bruce Wayne is currently behind her in the Iceberg Lounge. This is rather strange behavior from the billionaire, as he has gone on record before saying the Iceberg Lounge is quote, a hub of scum and villainy that anyone with a shred of morals wouldn't step foot in. Why Bruce Wayne has now chosen this as his evening's activity is beyond her, but more information is soon to follow. Dick shuts off the screen, telling Barbara that it's time for the two of them to clean themselves up. They've got a date tonight. Barbara smiles, telling him that she thought they were way past their clubbing dates. Dick laughs, telling her that this one's a throwback and that he'll make it up to her. He walks over, grabbing her hand over her wheelchair and telling her that it should be fun, other than the part where he's going to interrogate this phony Bruce Wayne and get to the bottom of what's sure to be an overly complicated scheme. She laughs, telling him that he definitely owes her for this one, and kisses him on the cheek. 
Dick wheels Barbara into the front door, gazing at the giant iceberg that lay in the middle of the club, with a live jazz band to the side and a bustling of crowded tables. Dick whispers to Barb with a smile that this place has always given him the chills. Barb smacks his hand playfully, telling him to lay off the bad jokes they have work to do. A waiter in a fancy suit tells them that they have their table for two near the VIP lounge. Dick thanks him and wheels Barbara to the other side of the table. Dick tells Barb that she looks incredible. She thanks him, but tells him to focus up and look for Bruce. He leans in, telling her that it helps that they're next to the VIP lounge. He's sure to turn up there. He goes on to say that the only explanation for this Bruce would be Clayface, but he took a Lazarus pit bath and never came back. Barb tells Dick that she watched that happen. She never imagined Raish would ever get so weak. It baffled her. While she's talking, Dick spots Bruce with a few girls around him and an abnormally large amount of bodyguards. Dick asks Barb to see how many thugs he has with him. She wheels around, tapping the side of her glasses, activating her detective mode. When she looks in that direction, she sees 30 red skeletons. She relays this information to him, telling him that the interrogation plan he had isn't going to work, but she has another idea. She pulls out a pinprick from her wheelchair and hands it to Dick, telling him that he can use this to get a sample of his blood. Dick replies that he loves that about her, that she's quick on her feet. Knowing that he just said something stupid, he rubs the back of his head, apologizing. She tells him that he can apologize later, now get to Bruce before it's too late. He nods and heads over to the VIP area. A group of photographers gather over to Bruce, asking to take pictures of him and his lovely dates. Annoyed, he yanks a couple of girls by the arms and forces them to stand with him while he gives half-hearted smiles. Dick manages to grab one of the press badges on a table and swings a camera over his neck, walking closer to Bruce. When he gets to him, he covers his face behind his camera and uses an accent to tell Bruce to look over to him. He walks over, telling him that he's not posing right and puts his hand on his neck to adjust his head while also getting a sample of blood. It feels like a pinch to him, and he winces in pain, telling the reporter that he just pinched him. Dick stumbles back, telling Mr. Wayne that he's real sorry, he's just trying to get a good picture. After he snaps a couple terrible pictures, he thanks Mr. Wayne and walks back over to Barb, taking off the camera and badge. She asks him what was that accent. He chuckles, asking her why she didn't like it, he thought it was pretty good. She smirks, telling Dick that she's been here long enough, and that they can get going back to the cave. Dick replies that she couldn't be more right and gets up to start steering her. As they're walking away, they hear Bruce get to the microphone, addressing the lounge, thanking them for their generous hospitality tonight. He goes on to say that he wishes Oswald could be here tonight as he'd love to tell him this in person, but he guesses the news will spread in time. You see, the Cobblepots have always envied the Waynes, did back then and still do today. They always saw their financial downfall as the fault of his parents, but in reality, the blame was always there. Oswald decided to build this club on Wayne-owned property, presumably to spite him. Whatever the reasoning is, this cannot continue. The Iceberg Lounge and its surrounding land is under his jurisdiction now, as he is outright buying this land back. Oswald Cobblepot is a known terrorist and gunrunner, and Bruce will take back what has always been his. A voice shouts out from the crowd, saying that this will be over the penguin's dead body. Suddenly, all of the waiters drop their trays and pull out sidearms from their pockets, opening fire on Bruce. Bruce runs back and takes cover, while his bodyguards file out behind him and begin opening fire on the thugs. Dick looks at Barb, saying that they can't go anywhere nice anymore without gunfire following them. Barb tells Dick to find Bruce, while she does what she can out here. Dick squeezes her hand for a moment and heads up to the top floor. Barb wheels around the henchmen as they are too busy firing at the bodyguards. She opens one of the arms of her wheelchair and pulls out a few gadgets. One of the thugs runs past her, but is grappled back and thrust into the metal of the wheelchair, knocking him out. She then pulls out a mini gun jammer and jams multiple firearms, causing those thugs to get shot to pieces. While Dick is sprinting up the stairs, Tim contacts him, saying that he sees what's going on there and is on his way to help. Dick tells him not to come, saying that they can handle this, and that they need him at the cave watching for Jason. He acknowledges as Dick is kicking out one of the bodyguard's knees and throwing him, causing him to roll down the stairs. Another bodyguard opens fire at him, which he flips around him and kicks him in the back of the head, before picking up his gun and using the end of it to bludgeon another bodyguard. Bruce spots him and picks up a weapon, opening fire on him. 
If I had any more doubts in my mind about this being Bruce, they've all just been silenced, Dick says to himself. As he is getting close to Bruce, a massive thug grabs him from the side and throws him down. He runs up to kick him on the ground, but is flown backwards by a spring kick to the face by Dick. He stumbles back, but continues to throw his large hands at Dick, who gracefully dodges each punch and puts in a few counters of his own. It seemingly took an endless amount of punches and kicks before the big guy went down. Dick looked around, but Bruce was gone, so they needed to get going before the police showed up. Dick runs down the stairs to see Barb throwing a few well-placed batarangs at the thug's knees that caused them to fall to the ground incapacitated. Dick asks her if she's having fun, which she replies that she strangely is, but where's Bruce? Dick tells her that he got away, but that they need to get out of there before her dad shows up. This really is like old times, she replies, and they both head out of the lounge. Jason arrives back at Arkham Island and heads over to the abandoned solitary confinement wing where Bruce is being treated. The knight opens the door, seeing Crane hunched over Bruce. How's the process coming along, Crane? Scarecrow says that his mind is starting to break, albeit a bit slower than he was planning. Get this done, or Bruce's mind isn't going to be the only thing that's broken. Scarecrow refills his syringes, telling him that he'll be ready. He's upping the dose right now. Jason looks into Bruce's eyes that have started to glaze over and twitch. Just a brief period of time, and you'll be mine. The knight walks away, slamming the door behind him. Scarecrow laughs, saying that this is enough toxin to break 20 men's minds. This will destroy him. Bruce wakes up again in the darkness to see Joker wearing a cap that says flashback as he is standing in front of a door. He smiles his nasty grin as he welcomes Bruce back to the land of the, uh, dead, I guess, or nearly. Bruce tells him that he's going to find a way out of here. He just needs to figure out how. Joker complains, asking him why he'd want to get out of here. It's so much fun sifting through his mind to relive his most traumatic memories. Doesn't he think so? Bruce feels a sharp pain in his head that causes him to fall to his knees. Joker reassures him, telling him that all this pain will go away soon. But in the meantime, let's stop beating around the bush and get to the memory that's oh so touching at this particular time. The Joker fades away as the darkness envelops him as he begins to lose himself. Bruce wakes up in the Batcave, sitting at the back computer as Jason tells him to look up. Bruce sees that a police helicopter is spotlighting two trucks that are being chased by multiple police vehicles. GCPD dispatch confirms that the Joker has stolen military grade weapons and stashed them in these two trucks that are being driven by his henchmen. Bruce tells Jason to suit up. While Jason is suiting up, the words spoken by Bruce in his conversation with Alfred ring in his head. He confirms within himself that he'll show Bruce that he has what it takes to save Gotham, and that tonight, he's going to kill the Joker. As Jason is running towards the Batmobile, Alfred calls out for Jason to be careful out there. Jason shouts back that a little danger keeps you on your toes. Once he jumps into the Batmobile, they fly down the entryway as the waterfall separates and they soar into the air before landing back on the street and speeding towards the Gotham Highway. Using GCPD comm channels, they're able to locate the position of the two trucks, who are driving side by side. Batman tells Robin that these trucks are full of weapons that are being brought back to the Joker. The Batmobile launches two trackers onto each of the trucks. Robin tells him that he's going to take the right one, while Batman takes the left. Batman tells him that it's going to be too dangerous if he takes out a fully armed truck by himself, and that they should both take them out together. Robin snaps back that this strategy will take too long, and one of the trucks might get away. He tells him that he needs to trust him. After a moment of silence, Batman tells him to disable the truck as quickly as possible and report back to him. Robin smirks, telling him that he won't let him down. Batman engages the autopilot and sets the tracking to the left car. Batman and Robin spring out of the Batmobile, flying onto each of the trucks. As soon as this happens, the trucks break formation and split apart, going on opposite directions. Batman hops onto the step in front of the truck door and sprays a wad of explosive gel and jumps back onto the roof. He then holds out the gadget and detonates the gel, causing the trunk door to explode and sending the truck swerving. Batman flips in the air, grabbing onto the top of the truck and swings inside where he finds crates of weapons and a few clowns pointing their weapons at him. The thugs begin to shake as they open fire on him, 
woefully missing every shot. Batman throws down smoke and rolls out of the way of the gunfire, using a handful of three batterings to knock the weapons out of their hands and using the bat claw to slam a couple of them into each other. He then throws down a mini EMP that causes their weapons to stall along with the entire truck itself. He knocks out the last armed thug and busts open the partition between the driver and the back seats, slamming the thug's head into the steering wheel and throwing him to the side. He then hops into the driver's side and stops the truck, pulling it off to the side for the police to catch up to it. Batman then calms into Robin, asking him if he's subdued the other truck. But there's only silence. Back with Robin, he's on top of the truck and performs the same maneuver as Batman does, lining the back door with explosive gel and igniting it. He jumps in the air and uses his grapple hook to fling himself inside. However, instead of finding crates of weaponry, the truck is empty and dark. Just then, a secondary metal door slams shut behind Robin. He turns on his detective mode and sees one red skeleton, but before he can make any move, someone jumps on top of him and throws him to the ground. He attempts to get up but is sprayed in the face with something. Laughter begins to build within himself, but he is quickly subdued by a hammer to the side of the face. A voice can be heard coming from a communicator in his ear, which is picked up. Batman is on the other line, asking Robin if he has subdued the other truck. After a moment of silence, Batman hears laughter, saying that Robin can't get to the phone right now, but he'll call you as soon as he can. Dread builds inside Batman as he shouts for the Joker to let him go, or he'll be breathing out of a tube for the rest of his life. Joker laughs as he says that Robin is joining their little family now. He can overhear Harley saying that she always wanted a boy. Batman switches his comms to Alfred, yelling for him to boost the tracker on the other truck. Alfred tries to, but tells him that unfortunately the tracker had been removed or destroyed, as he's getting no lock on the signal. Batman jumps into the Batmobile that had been tailing the truck, and boosts through Gotham, scouring everywhere in the general direction that the truck was heading in, but nothing came up. Alfred tells him that perhaps he should get back to the Batcave so that they can figure this out together, but Batman denies this, saying that he's not coming back to the cave until he finds Jason. While Batman is scouring the city for that truck, Joker's thugs are driving the truck down the narrow road leading to Arkham Asylum. Harley is tying up Jason as he is regaining consciousness. He sees the Joker, who tells him that they are going to have so much fun together than he does with boring old bats. Jason looks up and spits blood into the Joker's face, smiling. Joker backhands him, telling him that he certainly didn't learn manners from the big guy. The truck pulls into the back of Arkham Asylum, where it's met by Frank Bowles. Joker gets out of the truck as his men bring Jason to the dilapidated confinement wing, patting Frankie on the shoulder, telling him that his wife and child would be so proud of him. Bowles shoves his hand off his shoulder, telling Joker to let them go. He fulfilled the end of his bargain. Joker's smile turns to a frown as he tells Frank that he hasn't even begun the end of his bargain and to wait for his next request. Knowing he could do nothing, he simply nods and walks away. The big grin returns to Joker's face as he sees Harley and the rest of his thugs hauling Jason away. Months go by as Batman night after night searches for Jason, scouring every corner of Gotham. Alfred tells Bruce that he doesn't want to say this, but it's highly unlikely the boy is still alive. He's not sure anyone could be after spending so much time with the Joker. Bruce tells Alfred that Jason is strong and that he's still holding on, he knows it and Joker doesn't operate from the shadows. He's going to want everyone to know what he's been up to, but he's going to find him before that happens. After an hour later of searching, Alfred demands that Bruce gets back to the cave immediately. Something's come up. Bruce shifts gear, flipping the Batmobile around completely and heads in the opposite direction. Once back in the cave, he jumps out of the Batmobile and runs to the back computer, where he sees a video of Joker broadcasting to all of Gotham, telling Batman to look at the new dynamic duo and points the camera to a bloody and beat up Jason. Joker remarks that, well, he's a bit more dynamic than his bloody partner over there. Joker tells Robin to say something to the nice people of Gotham, but he remains silent. Joker walks off camera for a moment and comes back holding a crowbar, which he proceeds to use to beat Jason. He looks back at the camera, saying that it's a work in progress, but putting in a little elbow grease should do the trick. If Batman would like to come and see them, then he needs to head over to Arkham Asylum to watch the fun. When Batman arrives at Arkham, he sees a crowd of police vehicles with Jim Gordon standing back with SWAT teams. Batman rushes over to Gordon, asking him what the current situation is. 
Gordon tells him that the Joker has Robin in the abandoned solitary confinement wing with his goons all surrounding it. There's no way for any of the police's forces to get in there without a bloodbath. Batman tells Gordon that he'll handle this, just be ready to push on his signal. Batman grapples up to a vantage point and turns on his detective mode, proving Gordon right. The building was crawling with his henchmen, as he tracked nearly 30 of them all strapped with firearms. But Batman was accustomed to situations like this and knew how to pull apart their defense. He first aimed for the snipers, brutally taking them down, as he wasn't holding back this time. He then moved on to the thugs overlooking the perimeter from the railings. Joker's voice can be heard over the loudspeaker as he says that it's nice of Batman to join them, that this is a very special day after all. He then says that he should hear Robin shouting for joy. The next voice is Jason's, who is screaming in agony from being tortured. Joker tells Batman that he's just dying for bats to come see them. Batman's rage increases as his attacks are borderline lethal towards the clowns. Once he had secured the outside of the building, he signals for Gordon and his men to breach it. Joker gets back on the loudspeaker, telling them all that if anyone other than Batman comes in the wing, he'll blow the building to smithereens, killing them all. Batman looks back at Gordon and puts his hand out, indicating for him to stay there while he finishes this. Batman creeps into the dilapidated building as the dingy lights flicker on and off. He looks around to see dried blood lining the walls, along with a few ancient looking dead bodies piled on the floor. Jason's screams come back through the loudspeakers in the building as Batman's adrenaline increases. He begins to sprint down the hallway, hearing more screams and the Joker's twisted laughter. Sweat is dropping like blood off of Batman as he runs as fast as he can down the grimy hallways. Once he reaches a door with a silhouette of a person sitting in a chair, he rushes to push it open, but is grabbed by two large thugs who throw him onto the ground. Knowing that he doesn't have time for this, he slides underneath one of them, kicking out both of his knees, causing him to fall to the ground before grabbing his arm and flipping over him, breaking it with all the force he had. The thug screams but is slammed headfirst onto the ground. The other thug charges at him as Batman pulls out a battering and stabs the thug in the stomach before flipping him up with a kick to the face before slamming him down. He looks up to hear more laughter coming from the room, but when he breaks the door down, all he sees is Jason slumped over strapped to a wheelchair, and a radio that's looping Joker's laugh over and over. Before he could even react, he hears the final tick of the bomb that's on his right and a timer that reads, one. Instantly, the bomb ignites covering the entire building in a wave of flames. Batman is sent flying back, his suit torn as he flies in the air, falling back with flames surrounding him. His ears are ringing and his vision is blurry as he sits up a few moments later, trying to collect himself. He shakes his head and gets back up, stumbling through the flames and rubble as he hears police sirens in the background. His vision and hearing are starting to come back to him as he moves even faster through the rubble. He then spots a body and runs over to it. He runs and crouches down, removing debris off of the body as he sees that it's Jason. His armor has all but melted off and his body is terribly scarred from not only the explosion, but also the torture. Bruce grabs Jason in his arms, telling him to wake up, pleading for him not to be gone. Jason moves his head slightly. I let you down, Bruce. I'm sorry. hand grabs onto Bruce's shoulder, telling him that it's so sad he wasn't able to see this happen firsthand. It would have been a riot. Bruce looks around as the darkness surrounds him again, as he is holding nothing in his arms anymore and the Joker is right behind him. Tears fall from Bruce's face as Joker consoles him, telling him that it's kind of funny how he thinks he let Bruce down, whereas in actuality, Bruce let him down. It seems failure is his greatest attribute, it really does define him. First his parents die, then creating him, then letting Barbara get paralyzed, then letting Jason down. What's next, letting your faithful butler accidentally drown himself? Bruce grabs Joker by the throat again, with Joker answering back that they've already been through this. He lost his opportunity to kill him a while ago. 
but he now has the opportunity to do something greater, much greater, and he can't wait to watch it all unfold. The knight walks back into the dilapidated room as Crane is giddy with excitement that he's perfect and that they're ready to begin. Cut him loose. Alfred pulls into the long driveway of the Batcave in the limo with Dick and Barb. After dropping them off, he takes it on a side route leading back into the garage. Dick wheels Barb to the back computer and hands her the pinprick as she puts it into the analyzer. Tim asks them how the chaos went back there. Dick replies that Barb was quite the badass, taking down thugs left and right. She smiles, telling them that it felt pretty good to be back out in the field again. It's been so long. Lucius walks out, asking her if the chair supplied all she needed for the evening. She thanks Lucius, telling him that he designed her chair incredibly well. As Alfred exits the elevator, he asks them if they were able to figure out what's happening. Just as they are about to answer him, the computer screen dings that it has a match and reveals that this blood was not Bruce Wayne's at all, but in fact, Thomas Elliot's. Tim looks over to Alfred, asking if this was the same Thomas Elliot that was Bruce's childhood friend. Alfred replies that this is the very same, and figured as much that Elliot was behind the charade. Dick asks him what he means by this, and Alfred replies that back in Arkham City, Bruce found Thomas, who was known at the time as the Identity Thief. Last time Bruce saw him, he was wearing a grafted on face that looked identical to Bruce Wayne's. He must have gone into hiding until Jason kidnapped Bruce. Oracle looks over to Alfred, asking if it's possible that Jason and Elliot are working together. Alfred says that he's afraid so, or this would be a rather large coincidence. He goes on to say that he's getting even more fearful for Bruce's safety, and asks if Lucius is able to get the tracker up and running. Lucius shakes his head, telling Alfred that nothing's come up, but he's still trying. Just then, a blip on the computer goes off. Lucius accesses it, saying that Bruce's tracker just came back online, and it says that he's here. Oracle's typing away, seeing that the security systems had been deactivated. The screen blips again, saying that he's right here. They all hear a stomp and turn around to see Batman standing behind them. Dick calls out to Bruce, asking where he has been and what's been going on. He stands there in silence, his hands gripped into fists that begin to twitch. Dick calls out to him again and starts walking toward him. Batman sees that he's in Crime Alley, his parents dead under him, and Joe Chill is making his way towards him. Chill's eyes become red as he starts talking, but his voice is deep, like a monster's. Crime Alley begins to crumble around him as flames engulf him. Chill walks over to Bruce, saying that it's going to be alright and putting his hands on Bruce's shoulder. Bruce puts his hand on his hand and pulls it back so far that it sprains it and throws him down onto the ground. Joker comes running in with a staff and begins to attack him. Batman dodges and weaves around the attacks, ducking under them and counterattacking by kicking him in the chest. Chill runs back at him, trying to tackle him to the ground, but when he wraps himself around him, Batman lifts his arms into the air and slams them down onto his back. Joker takes another swing at Batman, able to hit him across the face. He stumbles back, but when the staff comes back around, he grabs it, breaking it in half and using the two pieces to hit him in the knee and then the face. Chill and Joker get back up and run at Batman, who counters both of their attacks by jumping in the air and kicking them. He grabs Chill by the collar and headbutts him, then walks over to Joker and slams his foot down on his face. He continues to walk down the alley until he sees Jason in the wheelchair with his head down. He stumbles over to him, but Jason lifts his head up to reveal a demonic face who pulls out a batarang and throws it at him. Batman dodges the batarang and kicks Jason in the chest, causing the chair to slide back and fall over. He then sees two henchmen that he grabs and slams both of their heads together, knocking them out. Bruce's head begins to sear in pain as he grabs it and makes his way towards the light at the end of Crime Alley. Dick, losing consciousness, looks up to see Batman running back into the shadows and bright red slits coming toward them before he passes out. The Batmobile flies out of the Batcave as the world around Batman begins to become engulfed in flames and black clouds. Scarecrow is in his head, telling him that he let Gotham City down, let it burn to ashes. Giant syringes begin to stick up out of the ground, blocking his path. He continues to speed through Gotham plowing down cars and hurtling right towards the demons that inhabit the streets. Demonic cars begin to chase him as Scarecrow laughs, telling him that he is doomed, along with everyone he's ever loved. 
Scarecrow pops out behind a giant building as he is the size of a skyscraper and shoots beams out of his eyes. The Batmobile slides around the lasers as cars begin to fall from the skies and block his path. Suddenly a demonic helicopter shines its light down and Batman wastes no time firing missiles at it. It moves past the first missile but the second one hits, sending it flying to the ground below. Scarecrow jumps up again, this time throwing fireballs at the Batmobile. A secondary cannon comes out of the top of the Batmobile as it begins to fire at Scarecrow, giving him all it's got. Scarecrow reels back from the attack but keeps on the offensive, sends more vehicles his way. Batman locks onto the vehicles with his missile barrage and takes out multiple ones in seconds. The cars that are still left are being peppered with machine gun fire until they explode. Batman keeps launching missile after missile at Scarecrow until he eventually goes down. However, when he goes down, a cloud of fear gas sprays out, knocking out the power reserves of the Batmobile. Batman launches out of it, seeing the city entrenched in fear gas. A building comes up from the place that Scarecrow was hovering over, and dozens of skeletons are standing there. Batman glides over and begins attacking the skeletons, putting them down with ease. A couple of them begin to fire at him, but he used the disruptor to target their weapons and lock them down. Another skeleton pulls out a knife and begins to swing at him, but he dodges the attacks before popping the knife out of his hand and slamming the skeleton's face into his knee. Once they're all taken care of, he grapples up to another building and flings himself into the air, overlooking the destroyed city, until a voice calls out to him. He looks down to see a woman shouting for him, so he pivots in the air and glides onto her rooftop. All he sees is a figure, asking him what is he doing and where has he been. Batman moves closer to see who the woman is. Her back is turned to him, but the voice is so familiar. It's in the back of his mind, but he can't put the pieces together. She says that she's been worried about him, and that her suspicions have become true. Something is happening to him, and she wants to help him. He stumbles closer to her, and she turns around, saying that it's his beloved. Her stomach is leaking blood from the gunshot wound, and she tells him that he failed her, that she died right in his arms and he did nothing. He apologizes to her, telling her that he would have done anything to save her. She replies that if he truly loved her like he claimed, he would have killed the Joker. He grabs her shoulder, telling her that he couldn't, it goes against everything he believes in. She tells him to look around, this is what his beliefs have done to Gotham. It's in ruins because of him, because he failed to do the right thing. She turns around and begins walking away, but he reaches over and grabs her shoulder, turning her around. Her face is changed to that of a demon as she attacks him. He grabs her and throws her over his shoulder and onto the ground. She jumps up and leaps at him, but he ducks under her attack and slides, kicking her feet out from under her. She tries to roundhouse kick him, but her leg is grabbed as he twists it around, spraining it, and kicks her in the chest. He looks down to see that she is knocked out and tells her again that he is sorry before jumping off of the roof and gliding away. Tim wakes up in a warehouse sitting on a chair and looks over to see Dick tied to a pipe and Barbara with her arms tied down to her wheelchair, both of them having duct tape around their mouths. Tim rubs his eyes to make sure that what he's seeing is real, but when he puts his hands down, he sees the Arkham Knight standing between Dick and Barb. I told you we wouldn't be so civil the next time we met. Tim tells Jason that he isn't going to join him and he's not leaving Gotham, so stop wasting time. I wouldn't talk so quick if I were you. Their lives are in the balance. You have a simple choice to make. Join me and become an Arkham Knight, my equal, not my sidekick. Or decline my offer and watch them die right in front of your eyes. Tim replies, asking why kill them? Why not try to make them Arkham Knights too? They've been with the old man for too long. They're too blinded by his hypocrisy to change. But you... You've only been with him for a few years now. You like how he keeps putting you on the sideline, never helping him when he truly needs it? I watched you in Arkham City, saw you deal with those ninjas with ease, and he still told you to leave and don't come back. Is that the kind of partnership you want, to be treated like trash? I know what it feels like, Tim. I don't want that for you. Tim sits back, truly thinking about what Jason is saying for a moment, instead of brushing him off. You're smart, Tim. A genius, even. Can't you see that his method doesn't work? Night after night, putting away the same criminals that were jailed a few weeks prior. You really think someone like the Joker would have ever been rehabilitated? He was insane and loved it. 
He'd probably be out there right now slaughtering people if I hadn't stopped him. I was the one who poisoned the Joker so that he couldn't kill any longer. Batman would say that I'm just becoming a criminal, but I'm saving Gotham in a way not even the police can. Nine months of peace, Tim. Nine months without the Joker's madness or Two-Face's assaults. I did that, not Bruce. Tim starts to realize something that he never would have thought. That Jason has a point. That Bruce's way isn't always the best way. Tim tells Jason that he's not a killer. Let me ask you this, Tim. If someone took your parents and brutally tortured and killed them right in front of your eyes, would you kill them? Barbara starts to talk, but is muffled by the tape around her mouth. Jason rips it off. What was that, Barb? Trying to talk your way out of this situation? She replies, telling him that he's insane, while also saying that it's a bit insulting that no one respects the chair. She taps the side of her wheelchair, emitting an EMP that short circuits his helmet. Using this time, she pops out a batarang and frees herself before throwing it at the rope holding Dick to the pipe. Once his visor comes back online, he points his gun at Dick, but is slammed down by Tim using his bullet shield. Jason jumps back up, using his bat claw to grab onto Barbara and slam her against Tim. Dick flips in the air and dives down at him, but Jason sidesteps this and offers a counterattack that's blocked by Dick. The two attack and counter each other, further showcasing their vastly different styles of combat. Dick is graceful yet powerful, while Jason is brutal and more grounded. Once Tim helps Barb back up, he runs at Jason again with his bullet shield, but this time, Jason grabs Dick and puts him in front of the battering ram, causing Dick to fall back onto the ground. Jason pulls out his knife and starts swinging at Tim, which he continues to block with his staff until Jason ducks below him and cuts his leg with the knife. While he's fighting them, he hears a message on his comms, telling the knight that the asset is in position and that he needs to get over here. I'm on my way, Knight says before grabbing Tim and slamming him onto the ground. Dick throws one of his escrima sticks, but Jason throws down a smoke bomb and vanishes, causing the escrima stick to fly at nothing. Dick picks up the escrima stick and limps over to Tim, helping him up before getting to Barb. He asks her if she's okay, and she replies that even in this wheelchair, she's still saving his ass on a daily basis. He grins, but then hears the sound of a TNT countdown. He grabs Barb and lifts Tim up, grappling out of the warehouse as it begins to explode behind them. Once they're safe, he looks back at her saying that they're even now. Once they arrive, they're greeted by Alfred and Lucius, who are so thankful that they're okay, but they have some troubling news to fill them in on. The advanced strain of fear toxin that we synthesized previously has proven to give Scarecrow the ability to control his victims. This explains why Bruce came here that night and started wreaking havoc. However, he didn't stop there. He took the Batmobile, blasted his way through the streets, harming thousands of people, and worst of all, engaged in a full-on assault at the GCPD building. Barb, with visible dread on her face, asks if her father is okay. Alfred replies that he is okay, but that he can't say the same for many of the officers that were there. Tim asks Alfred if he's saying that Bruce actually killed police officers. Alfred puts his hand to his face, saying that he's afraid so. Everyone is in shock, but Dick remarks that this isn't Bruce's fault. He'd never do this willingly, and they have to break Jason's alliance and free Bruce. Lucius is sitting at the back computer when he tells them to look at this news broadcast. Vicki Vale is standing in Wayne Tower as a press conference is about to begin. She explains that billionaire Bruce Wayne has been making waves these past couple weeks, from merging his company with Lex Luthor's to starting a territorial war with Oswald Cobblepot, aka the Penguin, to now stating in this press conference he will publicly announce the identity of the Batman. She looks behind her to see Bruce getting to the platform and she sits down. Bruce stands before them all, with pictures being taken of him every second by dozens of reporters, and says, Good evening, Gotham City. These past couple of weeks have been a real change in the way that I operate my business. These are changes that I have made for the better. Gotham will see growth and progress. However, there are a majority of people that don't appreciate what I do for this city, what I've done for this city. I've given up everything to make Gotham a better place. And what thanks do I get? The hatred of its citizens. But not any longer. I'm tired of hiding the truth from Gotham. You all came today to hear me announce the true identity of the Batman. 
He's operated in this city for so long, and yet none of you have the brain capacity to figure it out. It's been staring you in the face for 18 years now, and you still haven't figured it out. My name is Bruce Wayne, and I am the Batman. The press all gasp in shock as photos start flying rapidly out from the crowd, and every reporter is trying to ask him questions. Police officers get onto the stage to arrest him for the murders of their comrades. A person in an oversized hoodie stands up and pulls their hood back, revealing blonde hair with two pigtails, one black and the other red. She pulls out two pistols and opens fire, unloading every bullet of her magazine into Bruce's head and body. Bruce flies back as bullet holes cover the entirety of his body. Before the police can react and pull their weapons out, they are shot down by henchmen, who pull clown masks over their faces. Harley pulls off the hoodie and stomps over to Bruce's dead body, kicking him and saying that was for her pudding. All the reporters sprint out of the building as she gets onto the stage in front of the cameras, calling all Gothamites morons and telling them that she's in control now, now that the stupid bat is dead. And don't even think about trying to stop her, as she has a whole army of clowns at her back. She begins to sob, saying that Mr. J would have loved to see the mess that Gotham's in now. It would have put a big smile on his face. But now, everyone gets to have a big smile on their face, as once the laughing gas bomb goes off, everyone's going to be happy for once. Goodbye for now, she says before shooting the camera. Dick looks over to them, saying that they have to get there right now. Lucius tells him that that's not the best idea, as she won't be staying there very long. Rather, they should look for where she's going to be. Oracle gets onto the back computer to help Lucius pinpoint her next location. Just then, a broadcast comes directly to the Batcave, and the Arkham Knight is on the screen. I wanted you to see Bruce's reputation die before your eyes, before you're all left with nothing too. Just as the feed goes away, the cave starts to shake as bombs go off, leveling it. The back computer goes into an error mode as everything starts to collapse. Dick grabs Barb and picks her up as Tim brings Alfred and Lucius to the Batmobile that pulls back into the cave from where Bruce left it. It flies in and stops in front of them, opening up for them to get inside while Dick and Barb get onto his bike and they launch out of the crumbling and burning cave. Back in Wayne Tower, Harley orders her thugs to torch the place and get moving. Three of her goons pull out flamethrowers and begin lighting Wayne Tower ablaze. On a rooftop overlooking Wayne Tower where the press conference was held, Azrael stands, watching Bruce Wayne, the Batman, be consumed by the flames. He talks out loud, saying Gotham would burn, and so would he. That was the prophecy that was spoken to him, yet he did not take heed of those words and succumb to his fate. Azrael begins to hear the voices in his head as he kneels down, awaiting their words. The voices say that the Batman is dead, the prophecy has been fulfilled, and now is his time to take over the mantle of the Batman, and reclaim Gotham as the Order of St. Dumas' throne. Azrael replies, saying that their commands will be executed. He stands up, sword drawn, ready to kill Harley and cleanse Gotham, until he looks out onto another roof, seeing another Batman. Anger floods over him like a tidal wave, as he screams that the mantle of the Batman is his, only his, and that he will destroy any pretender that gets in his way. He sees that this Batman glides onto the roof of Wayne Tower, and goes inside. Jumping down the hatch, Arkham Knight says, Nigma, I'm going to need you to track Harley's signal through Wayne Tower. This place is like a maze and I'm not going to lose her. Nigma tells him that if he can hack the Batcave's security system, this should be a piece of cake for him. He begins to walk down the hallway, seeing Harley's clowns all over. He gets into cover, waiting for one to round the corner before he stabs him in the chest with his knife and pulls him to the side, breaking his neck. He looks over to see another thug walking around, burning every corner of the tower. He pulls out a shuriken out of his belt and throws it at the tank on his back, causing it to explode. A couple of the other thugs run over to investigate as everything is going up in flames. Jason puts his knife away and runs to another corner of the room, grabbing one of the thugs and pulling him into the shadows, using his arm blades to cut his throat. Nigma patches back to him, saying that the elevator is jammed and that Harley is taking the stairs. She appears to be on the 10th floor now. He needs to hurry. Jason runs out of cover, popping the other thug in the head with his pistol before getting to the elevator door and sticking C4 on it. 
The door explodes and Jason jumps down the shaft, passing dozens of floors as he gets to the 10th and glides to it, exploding that door as well. It flies open as he spots Harley running with a couple of thugs behind her. He pulls out both his pistols and opens fire on the thugs, killing the ones surrounding Harley until she turns around and unloads her ammo on him. He disappears, and when she turns around to run away, he's standing right in front of her. She complains, saying that she already killed Batman. Who's he supposed to be? Oh, I'm much worse. He grabs her by the throat and slams her into one of the desks. I've been waiting for this day for a long time, Quinn, and I will have my vengeance. She ignores him, flipping backwards and pulling out her hammer from off the dead thug that was carrying it. She runs at him with ferocity, wildly swinging her hammer in every direction, breaking tables and desks left and right. While they're fighting, Azrael starts from below, getting into Wayne Tower from the front entrance. Thugs rush him with knives and bats, but he calmly pulls out his sword and begins slicing them up, breaking their bats with his blade and cutting them to pieces. One thug shoots at him a couple times with his pistol, but he blocks the shots with his gauntlets and jumps over to him, gutting him in the chest and throwing him off his blade. Another thug runs behind him, but without even having to look, he throws a knife behind his head, hitting the thug in the heart as he collapses. A group of armed clowns run out and open fire on him, but he throws down a smoke grenade, using the cover to take each of them out at a time, stabbing them in the neck with his knife or cutting their head off with his sword. He begins clearing floor after floor as Jason is toying with Quinn, getting every opportunity to deliver the same harm that she did to him all those years ago. Once she's on the ground, blood running from her nose and mouth, he pulls out his knife and begins to slowly walk towards her as she's crawling away. He runs up to her, grabbing her by the throat, and sends down his knife to end her. The knife is clashed by a sword as Azrael kicks the knight off of Harley. Harley thanks him, saying that he's her knight in, well, that's pretty dirty looking armor. Azrael ignores her, exclaiming that with Bruce Wayne gone, it's his right to take over as Batman. Azrael, is it? That lunatic from Arkham City? I don't care what garbage has been filled in your head, Gotham's mine. Azrael's rage is blinding as he flies at the knight, striking his sword with deadly precision. The knight pulls out his two pistols and begins to fight with them, punching Azrael and trying to shoot him all in one motion, but the attack gets dodged and Azrael kicks the gun from out of his hand. After dodging a few more sword swings, Knight rolls back, using his back claw to rip the sword from out of his hand. He pulls out his knife and charges at Azrael, attempting to strike in between where the armor meets for critical damage. Azrael uses his gauntlets as knives, countering the knight's knife while digging into his armor, scratching it and breaking off a piece near his symbol. Azrael exclaims that he'll rip that symbol off of his chest and plunge his sword there. Knight ignores his threats, reeling back so that more of his armor doesn't get destroyed. Knight charges in again, slamming the knife directly into his chest, but Azrael crosses his arm so that the knife falls between them and he extends out, snapping the blade apart and kicking the knight hard in the chest, causing him to fall to the ground. Azrael tells him to stop resisting fate and that he can make his death painless if he just submits. I don't submit, I subdue, he says as he jumps in the air, shooting his back claw at him again, but this time, Azrael quickly dodges the claw and grabs onto the cord, pulling him into the air before jumping up and grabbing the knight by the throat, slamming him onto the ground. Azrael crouches over the knight, telling him that he grows tired of this charade, and that he's studied all of the Batman's moves, as he reaches behind the knight to grab his sword from off of the ground, and puts the tip end of the blade through the knight's stomach as he screams in pain. Azrael proclaims that here, in the ashes of Wayne Tower, he will rise as Gotham's new Batman, sending Gotham to a new golden age. You may have studied his moves, but I've improved them. The knight says as Azrael looks down to see C4 strapped to his chest. Using the remaining strength that he has, he flips Azrael off of him, which pulls the sword out of his stomach, and when Azrael charges at the knight, he flips a switch, detonating it and blowing Azrael to pieces. Bruce did have a way with strategies. Works better than I thought it would. He lifts a piece of his stomach armor and sprays a healing agent on it that takes away a lot of the pain. He looks around to see that Quinn is gone, and that the flames have consumed the whole building, and that he needs to get out of there. He stumbles out of the window and grapples to a nearby building, struggling to pull himself up. 
Once he stands up, Nigma calms him through, telling him that Harley's signal is putting her at Ace Chemicals. Of course it is. He then broadcasts to his forces at Arkham Island. Listen up. As you all know, Harley Quinn has returned to Gotham with an army of clowns by her side. This isn't a surprise. I've been monitoring Joker's offshore accounts for activity for a while. That's why we've been preparing our army to fight back against hers. Batman is gone, and his allies are soon to follow. Even the police force has drastically diminished in power. Once we get rid of Harley, Gotham is ours for the taking. All forces need to converge on Ace Chemicals. We're going to hit her with everything we've got. Now move out! Out in the streets, Dick and Tim are driving through chaos as clowns are rioting in the streets, killing off the meager police force that's still out there. Dick patches through to the Batmobile, asking them where they're supposed to go now. The cave, along with the manor, are gone. Alfred replies that they need to get to the clock tower immediately. Tim looks at Alfred, asking him why they would go to the old clock tower. Alfred tells them to trust him and to get there as soon as possible. Just then, a few clown cars drive up behind them and thugs lean out of the sides and begin to fire on them. Tim yells for Dick to get ahead of him while he deals with the clowns. Dick acknowledges and boosts ahead of him as the Batmobile slows down enough for the cars to get ahead of him. He proceeds to lock onto one of the cars, launching an immobilizer that flips the car into the air, landing on its hood. The two other cars begin to speed up, hoping to lose the Batmobile. This proved to be foolish, as the Batmobile kept up with ease and got in the middle of them, sideswiping one so that it flew into a building, and hitting the other in the back so that it flew into a tailspin and crashed into another clown car. Once the Batmobile and Dick's bike reach the ground entrance to the clock tower, a wall opens, revealing space for the Batmobile and the bike to enter it. They pull in and get out as there is an elevator in the garage that will take them to the top. Tim continues to look around in awe as Dick says out loud that this is definitely something Bruce would make in his spare time. As the elevator reaches the top, they all walk out to see an empty room with a couple of bookshelves and a weird bust on top of one of them. Alfred walks over to it and pulls back the head, revealing a scanner that once activated welcomes Mr. Pennyworth. The bookshelves go down to reveal holographic monitors and a keyboard. Barb then asks Alfred why they never mentioned this place to them. Alfred replies that Bruce started working on this project after Jason died, but kept it a secret as this was to provide temporary safety and intelligence should the Batcave ever become compromised. Having the rest of the family knows this exists would have diminished the point of the clock tower. Dick answers that he doesn't appreciate being lied to, but they don't have time to argue right now. They need to find Harley before she detonates that bomb. Oracle gets to the keyboard and begins looking at surveillance footage of Wayne Tower. Just outside the front entrance, she sees that Harley ran out and got into one of the jeeps. She analyzes the vehicle, saying that these tires are Amertec D60s and that she can track their unique tread pattern using CCTV cameras placed throughout the city. After a minute or two of compiling the data, she shows that these trucks went to Ace Chemicals. Dick replies that he guesses that should have been pretty obvious to them. Oracle tells them that once they locate the bomb, they need to take this chip and stick it into the control station to upload a virus that will deactivate it. She tells them that this chip will be ready in about 15 minutes, so they can take this time to prepare for the fight. Nightwing notices someone on the other rooftop and tells Robin to wait for him in the Batmobile. He'll only be a minute. Dick grapples to the top of the clock tower to see Catwoman standing on a rooftop looking at the madness of the two gangs battling each other in the streets. Plumes of smoke fill the sky as gunfire is always persistent. Nightwing jumps over to the other rooftop, saying that she's probably already seen how this all started. She looks over to him, asking him where Batman went wrong. How did the city devolve into this chaos? He tells her that they're trying to pick up the pieces now, and that they could really use her help now. She sighs, telling him that the last time she saw Bruce was when he finished attacking the police station and she called out to him. She asked him why he was doing this, but he just spoke gibberish and attacked her. Whether he was under the control of something or not, Bruce is gone, and she has no motivation to stay here. And when it comes to who or what she'll fight for, she doesn't owe this city a damn thing. Dick replies, telling her that he understands, but that she knows where to find him if she changes her mind. He hopes she finds what she's looking for out there. She scoffs, telling him not to be so sentimental. She'll land on her feet. Cats always do. He nods to her as she leaps off the building and disappears into the night. 
Dick gets down to the bottom floor of the clock tower, where Tim is waiting for him in the driver's seat of the Batmobile. Dick tells Tim to move over, which he begrudgingly does, and asks him why he didn't tell Selina that that wasn't really Bruce. Dick explains to him that Bruce's reputation, as both Bruce Wayne and Batman, is gone. He'll never be able to show either one of his faces in Gotham again. There's no life for Bruce here anymore. Not sure if there ever was anyway, but they have to find Bruce and make sure that he can still actually live a life. This is what Bruce would have wanted, he's sure of it. Tim replies, saying that Bruce could have had the life he wanted if he would have killed the Joker and so many others when he first encountered them. Dick looks over to him in shock, asking him how he could possibly say that. Tim tells Dick that even though he's extreme, Jason makes a compelling argument. Look how safe Gotham was for the nine months after the Joker died. Yeah, it's gone to hell now, but after they take down Harley, it can go back to being safe again. Dick puts his hand on Tim's shoulder, telling him that he actually felt the same way a long time ago. Tim is stunned, asking him if he's serious. Dick nods his head, saying that he wanted nothing more but to kill Tony Zuko after learning that he had killed his parents. He got so close when he finally tracked him down, but in the end, Bruce convinced him not to kill, telling him that if he killed Zuko, the pain would never go away, and he wouldn't stop there. He'd see Zuko's face on every criminal, and after killing them, he'd never feel truly fulfilled. He'd just be a monster, a shell of his former self. Bruce almost went down that path with the Joker once before, but in the end, he knew what would happen if he did. And when Bruce told him that, he made the choice that day to spare Zuko's life, and it ended up saving his own. Unfortunately, Jason's gone down that path now. He has his own views and morals, sure, but inside, Jason was a good kid who was lost and seeking purpose in the world. His life ended too quickly for him to find that purpose, and now that he's back, he's stuck in the past, doomed to repeat the same mistakes forever. Dick tells Tim that he won't let that happen to him, and that even though the way they do things doesn't feel like it works, in the end, it actually does. It allows them to fight crime without being consumed by its darkness and warped into something they're not. Bruce can be obsessed at times, but he's not filled with pure hatred and rage, like Jason is now. As Tim is pondering what Dick said to him, Oracle comes on the line, telling Dick that the virus is programmed and the drive is ready for use. Dick leaves the Batmobile, grabbing the drive from Barb and getting back to Tim. Out in Gotham, Jason watches as the criminals of this city tear each other apart. In his mind, this is working out even better than he had hoped. By the end of the night, most, if not all, the criminals will have killed each other. But those who haven't died, he'll deal with personally. He dives off of the roof and flies into his own custom Batmobile, and speeds down the road to Ace Chemicals. Along the way, he uses his machine gun mounts to blow up and destroy every vehicle in his path, whether they're clowns or his own thugs. Every criminal faces his same brand of justice. Nigma connects with him, saying that he has found the chemical bomb, but it's actually more of a missile launcher. According to the schematics, it comes out of a launch pad and is shot directly above Gotham, coating it in Joker's original laughing gas formula. It's underneath the main chemical compound factory near the backside of the facility. Understood. I'm on route. He continues to mow down any criminal in Gotham that crosses his path. The greater the number of criminal deaths there are, the safer Gotham becomes. When Arkham Knight reaches Ace, he sees another war zone. Harley's clowns have turned Ace Chemicals into their fortress. Two-Face sends wave after wave of his thugs that continue to get slaughtered. At one point, he pulls out his signature grenade launcher and fires at the base of one of the towers, causing it to collapse, providing an entryway for the thugs to get into the compound. Nigma, give me the blueprints for this facility. I want to know exactly where I'm going. Nigma answers that he was one step ahead of him, and not only gave him the blueprints, but also marked on his visor where Harley and the bomb were. Looking at the marked location, both Harley and the bomb are in the central mixing chamber. Slaughtering every thug in his path, the Arkham Knight makes his way to the chamber. While Dick and Tim are speeding through Gotham, taking down as many thugs' cars as possible, Barbara gets a call from her father. He tells her that if she hasn't already, she needs to leave the city and wait until he tells her that it's safe again. Barb responds, saying that it's the opposite. 
He needs to leave the city until they have the situation handled. Jim pauses for a moment, then asks what she means by they. Barb answers him that she was going to tell him, but just needed the right time. This time isn't the right time, but there's nothing else she could say. Jim answers her that he knew she was Batgirl back in the day, but thought she'd given that life up after her accident. She replies that the accident only gave her more drive to continue fighting. She explains that the police force is weak and unstable after what happened, and he needs to get out of Gotham as soon as he can. He tells her that that was Batman, or he guesses Bruce Wayne's fault, whoever it was that did that charade. Barb tells him that that wasn't the real Batman, and he replies, saying that of course it wasn't, but his image is permanently scarred now. She tells her father that they're going to find him and bring him back. Now go, before something terrible happens. But that she needs to stay safe, no recklessness. She chuckles, saying that being safe isn't a part of the job description, but she'll do her best. He tells her that he loves her, and she replies with the same before ending the transmission. Alfred walks next to her, telling her that she is doing the right thing by removing him from this chaos and that they are going to succeed in their mission. She looks over to him, telling Alfred that they are going to end this madness tonight. Right you are, he says as he walks back over to Lucius. Once the Batmobile arrives at Ace Chemicals, Nightwing and Robin hop out to see that the facility has been torn apart and dead thugs from both sides are scattered all throughout. Oracle informs them that the layout of Ace is uploaded to their visors and that she can see where the bomb is located and that it's in the central mixing chamber. Also, by hacking into the camera feeds that are still left, she can see that Harley and her thugs are in there, but Jason is as well. As they're running to get to the chamber, Dick asks if Jason and Harley are working together. She tells him that she doesn't think so, seeing as how he's taking them out one by one from the shadows and leaving bloody pools behind. He curses, telling Robin that they need to get a move on before things get worse. In the central mixing chamber, Jason is using every lethal weapon that he has in order to subdue the thugs, from using his arm blades to gutting them, to breaking their necks, to shooting them in the back. He can hear Harley screaming, telling them to kill the stupid bat already. Instead of hearing typical responses from the thugs, all she hears is screaming. She then looks to the door of the central chamber to see the silhouette of the bat beating a thug to the ground and stomping on his face. She grabs the two pistols on the desk, holding them into the air as they are fidgeting in her hands. He kicks the door down and she begins to open fire. He dodges and rolls out of the way, although one stray bullet hits him in the shoulder where the plates meet, causing him to grab his shoulder for a moment as it starts bleeding. She begins laughing, saying that he isn't very tough for trying to be Batman. In anger, he flies at her, disarming her pistols and punching her in the stomach, causing her to fall to the floor. He looks to the side to see something on the ground. He moves out of her view as she is clutching her stomach and sees him again, but this time holding a rusted crowbar. She gulps, telling him that they can work something out, you know, maybe even be friends. I have a better idea. How about I torture you with this crowbar until the last thing you see is me standing over your fresh corpse? She laughs, telling him that he probably shouldn't do that, as the bomb is connected to her heartbeat. And if that goes, they all go. Oh, I'm counting on it. I just wanted to have a little fun first. She tries to crawl away, but he grabs her by the leg, pulling her back and slamming the crowbar onto her leg. After hitting her a few more times, the glass behind him shatters as Nightwing and Robin fly in behind them, with Nightwing asking if that's any way to treat a lady. Why can't you two just die already? He grabs Harley and slams her head onto the ground, knocking her out. Nightwing tells Robin that he'll handle Jason while he goes and defuses the bomb. Secure the bomb! The knight screams to his forces as Nightwing dives down and kicks him in the chest. He picks up the fallen crowbar back up, swinging it fiercely at him while he flips around the attacks. Nightwing tells him to look at himself, look at the carnage that he's causing. How is this saving Gotham? He's destroying it. Yes, Gotham's criminals have to destroy themselves before any real progress can be made. Nightwing asks how he could let Thomas Elliot die in such a gruesome fashion like that. Weren't they partners? Elliot knew his role and the risks associated with it. But in death, he accomplished his goal greater than he possibly could have imagined. 
Nightwing replies while dodging an attack, telling him that he's sick and needs help. What's sick is Gotham, how it's drowning in a cesspool of villainy because you're all too afraid to act. Jason goes for a right hook, but Nightwing grabs his arm and twists it before pulling him closer and kicking his helmet, causing it to crack as he hits the ground. Jason flips up and spins below Nightwing's punch and springs up, kneeing him in the face. Meanwhile, Robin reaches the lower level of the mixing chamber where the bomb is, and after defeating a few of Harley's thugs with ease, he puts the drive into the bomb. Oracle tells him that she's now in the system and will begin putting the virus into the bomb. Gunshots rattle behind him as Two-Face and his thugs run into the room. Tim yells at them, saying that it's pretty stupid to be shooting bullets in the same room as a bomb is in. He pops open his shield to deflect the gunfire before dropping a smoke pellet onto the ground. The thugs begin to cough and choke as Robin is taking them out, either by zip kicking them or putting snap flashes on their backs and detonating them when they are close to each other. He's dispatching the thugs in rapid succession, but when he almost takes them all out, he sees Two-Face holding one of his own thugs up while pointing a shotgun at his head. He tells him to stand down, or he'll kill this man without even thinking twice. Robin shouts out, asking him what kind of a man threatens to kill his own men. Two-Face laughs, saying a man that leaves life to chance, as he throws his coin into the air. For the split second that he looks in the air to see the coin, Robin throws a shuriken at his knee, causing him to fall to the ground, dropping the thug. Robin runs over and kicks the thug in the face before grabbing the shuriken out of Dent's leg and choking him on the ground. Robin looks into the demented eyes of Dent, one bloodshot and the other burned and scarred. Two-Face tells him that he's weak, that he knows he'll be right back out there on the streets looking for him. Everything that has been told to Robin over these past few days is flooding into his mind. He holds the shuriken above Two-Face's head as he hears Jason in his mind telling him that by killing his enemies, he never has to deal with them again, saving thousands of lives. But then Dick's voice says that he'll never stop seeing Dent's face out in the crowd of thugs, and in the end, he'll become the monster that he's always fought against. Robin's grip on Two-Face's neck gets tighter as he brings the shuriken closer to his head. Dent tells him to do it, or he'll regret ever sparing his life. He'll go after everyone he loves. Robin's hand starts to shake as he is clenching the shuriken with all his force. Even a tear goes down his eye. For a moment, everything goes silent as Tim makes a decision that will change his life forever. He lifts the shuriken into the air as Two-Face says that he'll see him in hell and slams it down. I'd rather see you in jail. Robin says as he punches Two-Face in the nose, knocking him out. Just then, Oracle comes into Robin, telling him that the virus upload is complete and that all he has to do is manually shut down the room. Robin runs over to the control lever and swings it down as the security system says that the system is deactivated and the power is down. Upon hearing this, Jason grabs Nightwing and punches him in the face, knocking him down for a moment. Frantically, he says, Cobblepot, prepare the defenses. I'm on my way back. Just as Robin runs back up the stairs, Jason pulls out his pistol and shoots an explosive canister, causing fire to separate him from Robin and Nightwing. He grabs Harley and flees the facility. Robin tells Nightwing that Oracle disabled the bomb, but that he has to get Dent and a few of his thugs out of here before they get consumed in the fire. They both run down to grab Dent and his thugs, and Nightwing sees that a shuriken is right next to Dent's head. He looks over to Tim, telling him that he made the right decision, before they grab the thugs and bring them out of Ace Chemicals. After they get in back of the Batmobile, Oracle tells them that they need to get back to the clock tower. Lucius has something for them that they are going to need. Once they get there, she tells them that by using the CCTV camera feeds throughout the city, she was able to track Jason and Harley through Gotham, and they're not going to like where he took her. She then pulls up a picture of Arkham Island, saying that he's turned it into his own personal base. When she tries to hack into their feed, a giant green question mark comes onto her screen. It then turns into a giant green maze. Dick asks how the Riddler is involved in this. 
Oracle replies, saying that she knew someone smart was on the inside, as she found a particular virus in the Batcave security system that was too well placed for a typical hacker. Tim speaks up, saying that he guesses Jason forced Riddler into helping him too. Oracle is studying the screen, seeing that it appears to be a simple line maze where she needs to get to the middle, but every move she makes, he keeps throwing more firewalls her way. She tells them to go meet with Lucius, and that she'll take care of this. Dick and Tim go to the back where they see Lucius and Alfred putting something into vials. Lucius turns around when he hears them, saying that if they are going to find Bruce, they're going to need these. Dick picks up one of the syringes, asking Lucius what's in it. Lucius explains that when Bruce was attacking them at the cave, he was profusely sweating. Once Alfred and him came to, he swabbed a sample of his sweat and looked for trace elements of the fear toxin. Once the compound for the toxin was identified, he reverse engineered the components to act as a counter to the effects. Tim chimes in, saying that in essence he created an antidote. Lucius nods, telling him that he made as many syringes as he possibly could, but that it only made 12. Dick's eyes widen, saying that he's pretty sure they aren't going to have to stick Bruce 12 times with this stuff. Alfred answers back, asking Dick when does Scarecrow ever use his toxin on only one person. Dick replies, saying that's a good point, and Lucius walks over to them, handing them each a retrofitted disruptor that now shoots out the antidote. They fold them in half and stick them onto their utility belts before heading back over to Oracle. She's still working on the maze, and tells them that it's going to take a little bit, but that they don't have any more time to waste. They need to get to Arkham Island before it's too late. They both nod and start to walk away, when Barb grabs Dick's arm, telling him to come back to her in one piece. He smiles, telling her that they already dealt with Two-Face, so at least he won't be coming back in two pieces. She shakes her head, telling him that she's serious. He smiles, telling her that he'll come back, he'll make sure of it. He then leans down and kisses her, before going down the elevator and getting into the Batmobile. Along the way to Arkham, the gangs are still fighting each other, albeit the majority of the clown forces retreated when Harley was taken down. Taking down as many vehicles as they could along the way, they began to drive down the familiar road leading to Arkham, but stopped short and grappled to the top of intensive treatment to plan out their attack. Oracle comes in, saying that she's deactivated the Riddler's security system and put a virus in his command console, ensuring that he wasn't going to be a problem any longer. As for their defenses, they were all linked onto the same channel, so she was able to shut down their turrets and other mounted weapons. By looking at the security feed, she still sees a sizable henchman presence, but most of them were out in the streets. However, she tells them not to put their guard down, as this is still Arkham Island they're talking about. They look at their utility belts to see that the retrofitted disruptors are there, and Dick tells them that they need to find Bruce before it's too late. Just then, Robin gets kicked to the side as Nightwing is grabbed by Batman, whose eyes are now a sickly green, and his face is full of veins. He throws Nightwing onto the side and begins to slowly walk towards them. In Bruce's head, he's still fighting against Crane's toxin, which now sees him running through his fragmented mind, keeping away from Scarecrow's gaze as he navigates, trying to find his way out. He sees Joe Chill and Joker again, and his anger flares up as he begins to attack them. In reality, Nightwing and Robin begin to fight Batman, but even in his lowest mental health, he is still outpacing them in fighting ability. Every kick and punch is deflected and given a counterattack. Batman's fighting style is unmatched, as he is prepared for every type of fighter. Back in his mind, he hears Scarecrow taunting him, saying that it's pathetic to try and fix his broken mind. It's been this way since his parents were murdered. He grapples up to a rooftop, where he looks down to see Crime Alley, with his father, mother, and Jason in a pile together, screaming that he failed them. He grabs his head and falls, all of the strength left in his body is fighting back. In Arkham, as they are fighting, Robin feels shaking and is grabbed by a giant plant that's oozing toxin. He looks down to see Ivy and Scarecrow together. He then sees the knight, who says, Oracle is good, I'll give her that, but we still have plenty of defense left to offer. Robin pulls out the cure from his belt along with a gas mask and begins plunging them into the plant. Ivy stumbles back as the plant releases its grip from Robin, and he glides down to the roof of the botanical gardens. Oracle informs Robin that the plant has noticeable weaknesses along the sides, as the toxin is flowing through the plant via the giant vein circling it. Robin thanks her as he begins to attack the vein. 
Nightwing pulls out the Disruptor from his belt and shoots a few shots at Bruce, but he dodges or grabs them in midair and throws them back. In his mind, he sees that he is at the graveyard where his parents are buried, as all the graves stir and the skeletons begin to attack him. They're throwing knives and running at him, but no matter how many he takes down, they never stop coming. Nightwing rolls around Batman and pulls the Disruptor up, but Batman grabs it out of his hands and throws it off the side of the building. Nightwing screams in anger as his chance to cure Bruce was all but gone, as Robin is using his syringes on Ivy and Scarecrow's plant. He begins to fight Batman, desperately pleading for him to snap out of this, that he's stronger than this. In his mind, the graveyard is overflowing with skeletons as he is desperately trying to hold on to his sanity. Suddenly, he is grabbed in place by one of the skeletons, unable to move. As Nightwing is countering a punch from Batman, he hears the crack of a whip and sees it wrap around his body. Catwoman flips in the air behind Batman and lands on his back, sticking the cure into the back of his neck. Batman reels in pain as he slumps to the ground. In his mind, the graveyard full of skeletons disappears, and he is back on the floating rooftops where he sees Scarecrow hovering overhead. But then, a beam of light appears in the distance as it reveals the bat signal out in front of him. He reaches the rooftop that the signal is on, but he is grabbed and thrown on the ground as Joker stands over him and starts choking him. He says that he won't let him spoil all the fun and that it's better this way. He maniacally laughs as he is choking Batman, but he's not strong enough. Batman's willpower exceeds Joker's attacks and he kicks Joker off of him. He then grabs him by the throat and lifts him up. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman. He slams him onto the ground and runs over to the bat signal. The giant scarecrow sees him, yelling that he can't stop this, he won't let him, but is shot through the chest by the beam of light that causes him to explode. Nightwing watches as Batman falls to the ground and Catwoman lands next to him. Dick looks to her, saying that he thought she said she didn't owe Gotham a damn thing. She tells him that this is why she fights. She just thought she'd lost it all, but she hasn't yet. Batman stands back up, his eyes back to normal color and the veins disappearing from his face. He rubs his head, asking them what happened. Dick replies, maybe later, as Ivy's plant begins to attack them. Catwoman lunges out of the way, throwing Nightwing his disruptor back as he begins to pepper the plants with the cure. It begins spewing out fear toxin, so Nightwing puts a gas mask on and throws one to Catwoman, as Batman tells him that he won't be needing that. He tells Nightwing and Catwoman to help Tim with Ivy and Crane, while he goes after Jason. Batman grapples onto the rooftop of Arkham Mansion and sees through the glass Jason torturing Harley. The bomb may have been deactivated, but at least I still get to kill you, he says as he's beating her with the crowbar. Batman slams through the glass and drops in front of him, telling Jason that it's over. How is this possible? You are broken. Your mind in my control. Batman runs at Jason as he ducks behind the wall, and Penguin comes out of the side with sentry turrets and his thugs. Batman doesn't have time for this, and hacks the sentry turrets before grabbing Penguin, kneeing him in the face, and throwing him into the crowd of his own thugs. He then pulls Jason over with the back claw before grappling up with him onto the roof. Rain begins to pour as Batman and the Arkham Knight face one another. Both have their armor broken or cracked in certain ways, but there's no more time for talk, only a last battle to the death. Jason flies at Bruce, using the last of his strength to attack Bruce in every way possible, from flip kicks to hooks to grabs, everything he had learned was on display in this fight. But Bruce taught him these moves, and knew how to counter them while putting in his own attacks. Without the use of most of his tools, Jason was quickly becoming outmatched by Bruce, but was still able to get him on the ground a few times, smashing his face with his metal fists and slashing his breastplate with his gauntlets. Batman kicked him off, but in midair, Jason pulled out his two pistols and fired on him as he landed back on his feet. Bruce deflected a couple shots with his gauntlets, but one tagged him in the leg. Adrenaline was rushing through him, so much so that he wasn't phased by the bullet in his leg and sprinted to Jason, kicking the pistols out of his hands and tackling him to the ground, as he begins to punch the helmet over and over with so much force that it cracked it in half. Bruce rips the helmet off of Jason, saying that the Arkham Knight is not who he is. Yes, it is, Bruce. You just don't want to admit that you made a mistake bringing me into your fold. 
I was never like you and never will be. Bruce holds out his hand, telling him that he's giving him one last chance to come back, one chance to right all of his wrongs and be better. You had your chance, Bruce, but I'm not you or one of your lackeys. I'll be back and Gotham will be free from you. Bruce shakes his head, telling Jason that he could have been a true hero. He puts his outstretched hand on Jason's armor and ground pounds him. Bruce stands over Jason as lightning strikes, illuminating the two as Batman stands triumphantly over him. Bruce looks down to see that they're still fighting Ivy and Crane. Robin is seen using both disruptors to fire the last remaining shots into the plant vein while Catwoman pounces on Ivy, saying this is for what she did to her in Arkham City. She uses her claw to slash Ivy's face as the plant reacts to her pain and begins to violently crash into the Botanical Gardens building. Crane is seen injecting more of the plants with toxin, but Nightwing throws his Eskrima stick at his hand, knocking the syringes onto the ground. Scarecrow yells and tries to run in the opposite direction, but Batman is standing behind him and punches him in the face, sending him crashing to the ground. Robin fires the last syringe into the vein of the plant as it wildly crashes around before shriveling and falling onto the gardens, destroying the roof and causing the building to collapse. Batman looks around, seeing the carnage that has just unfolded, along with Robin, Nightwing, and Catwoman all standing around him. Catwoman walks up to him and slaps him in the face, saying that he has a lot of explaining to do. Bruce looks at her, telling her that he'll explain everything, but that he needs to leave before anyone sees him out here, as he's sure that he caused enough mayhem. Dick tells him that's not even the half of it, as Bruce tells them to round up everyone, but that he'll take Jason. The next few nights involve Nightwing and Robin cleaning up the rest of the streets from the thugs and clowns while the police round them all up and start shipping them all off to Bell Rev. Gordon returns to Gotham, helping Bullock, Montoya, and others retake the city from the thugs and lunatics. In Bell Rev, Jason wakes up in his cell as he sees that he's handcuffed to his bed. He tries to resist as Tim comes out of the shadows, telling him that he understands what Jason was saying but that it was flawed and turned him into something that he didn't have to be. Under his shadow, Gotham will never be safe. You know that. Tim replies that there's always another way and that it's not too late for him. You're talking like him now, thinking there's something wrong with me, but this is who I've always been. He's just never been able to accept that. Tim tells him that he won't give up on Jason, but that his method is flawed and always will be. I'll be out of here soon, and I won't spare you again. Tim walks back into the shadows as Jason slumps down in his chains. Bruce stands in front of them all, telling them that he is proud of each of them, how they were able to save Gotham in spite of him. Bruce Wayne, the Batman, they're gone, destroyed by his actions and decisions. He tells them that they never have to forgive him but he wants them to know that he'll never put himself in a situation where he can hurt them again. They're his family, and he failed them, like so many times before. Dick reaches out to Bruce, saying that he hasn't failed any of them. They knew what they were getting into when joining this life, the risks involved. He's been a better mentor to all of them than even he could have imagined. Bruce thanks them, saying that he unfortunately can't stay in Gotham any longer. This means that he will have to leave them for a while, discover a new way to strike fear into the hearts of criminals. Gotham is in their hands now, and he fully trusts that they'll be able to take care of it better than he ever could. He instructs them to have each other's back, watch over the city together, and work as a unit. Dick will still be operating in Bloodhaven, but Bruce trusts that he will come to Gotham in its hour of need. Dick nods his head, saying that Gotham is always under his protection. Bruce walks over to Alfred, telling him that he no longer works for him anymore and might need to look elsewhere. Alfred tells him that he has a family to look out for and hugs Bruce, telling him that he will find his way eventually. Bruce takes one last look at the clock tower and heads down the elevator leading to the garage. He pulls out in his black Porsche only to see Selina in front of the door. She tells him that this city has nothing left to offer and that she's coming with him. Bruce tells her that the road he's going down is a permanent one, and that if she comes with him, her life changes forever. She tells him to stop being so dramatic and hops in as they drive away out of Gotham. 
A camera pans over Gotham as the sunlight hits the city, showcasing the aftermath of the destruction and mayhem that had been caused. A voice behind the screen calls out, saying that Gotham has never changed and never will. Another voice says that the Batman protected the streets for years, yet no real progress was ever made. The other voice replies, saying that he failed in his pursuit and it cost him his life. Gotham had a hundred years to prove that it could save itself, but clearly it can't. It's time for Gotham to go back to a civilized order under our watchful eye. Gotham must never be allowed to fall this far again. The man stands up and turns around towards a table full of suited men and women in dresses as they all reach down, putting on their masks. And that's the end of my story. For all of you who stuck around to the end and finished this insanely long video, you are the true hero, so thank you so much. So what did you think of this rewrite? Did you enjoy it, or do you still prefer the original story the game gave us? Let me know all of this in the comments below. Also, I know I've mentioned this a couple of times now, but if you guys enjoyed this video even in the slightest bit, please consider leaving a like and subscribing. As you can tell, this video took me a very long time, as I wanted to make sure that it was the best it possibly could be. This means that I'd love it if this video got recognized enough so that people who enjoy this kind of content can see it. So thank you so much for helping me. Also, if you ever want to hang out with me while I'm streaming, head over to my second channel, Rewriter Gaming, where I play story games and interact with you all. It's a lot of fun and I'd love to see you there. The link for that is also in the description below. Thanks again so much for watching this video, and this is the Rewriter, writing out.